Gregory, welcome to Dad Edge, my friend. It's good to have you on. Thank you so much. Good to yeah. be here. Good, good to, to have be you. Here. Uh, fascinating topic, as the guys heard in the intro. Mm -hmm. 650 shows, been podcasting for six years. Uh, I don't think we've ever covered this topic. So mm. excited mm. to talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think this topic has a, a way of sneaking under the radar almost, almost by design. Mm -hmm. I, I think that it, it's, it's just part of the, part of the essence of it. So yeah, I'm excited. To well, talk. I'm really fascinated to understand like why you even got started with this particular topic. I mean, I have all mm -hmm. the, all the man topics out there. Mm -hmm. I hadn't even really thought of this one too much until we were connected. I think it was by your agent or your, by your publishing company. Mm -hmm. And I've read the description and I was like, I started thinking about people in my own life that I know that struggle with exactly what we're going to talk about. So I think we have, we're going to have two types of men that are going to listen to this show. Number one, the guys who are dealing with this right in there, you know, anywhere from 18 to possibly even 40, I know it's mm -hmm. 18 to 35 in your book, but also maybe the men who see some of these behaviors in their their teens, their tweens, and their, you know, as they maybe even get into college and, and maybe some things that we can do to head these things off, right? And to create more independent young men out there. So I'm excited mm -hmm. to get into this. Before we do that, tell us about your childhood. What was it like growing up for you and relationship with your own father and mother, the whole nine yards, man? Yeah. Uh, so I, um, I grew up uh, in a very, uh, very nice town, a family and community oriented town in New Jersey and uh, had uh, two wonderful parents. I'm the oldest of three brothers and um, had, uh, you know, one, one really kind of uh, exciting, at least for me, part of my, my life was that my father immigrated here uh, in his late twenties from Greece. And so in the summers, we would, you know, we would go back to Greece. And as a very young child, I got exposed to two different cultures, you know, this American culture and then the Greek culture. And they were they were totally different, you know, and um, I, I just, uh, you know, loved uh, both and, and really took in, you know, what both had to offer. Uh, but one thing that, that probably is that comes to mind that's you know, relevant for this, you know, this talk is that I felt like my my father, who did a one as great of a job as he could do, he he immigrated here and he was really uh, trying to win the battle economically. You know, he was trying to survive. He was trying to ascend to give us a better life. You know, he grew up in, you know, not uh, really, not with a lot of money. And so he, he really wanted to, uh, you know, to devote a lot of time to his work. And I, I think the fact that he spent time there and then the fact that he was an immigrant, there was a big distance in the years that I really needed a strong male role model. And uh, yeah, I guess fortunately for me, I grew up in an era where there, there were these strong male role models in the community. So I would seek these men out like a sponge and just soak in all of their wisdom and all of their, you know, their power and confidence. And uh, I, I made a go of it. And, you know, the book has my story. Uh, if people want to read more, it, it just showed how how I ended up finding the answers that that I feel we all all of us men need in the world. Yeah, I love how you talk about your your father. You you have a lot of respect for your father. I do. Yeah, I do. And that's evident just in the way you talk, even your voice, like how you talk about him. Like there's this. Mm there's this calm yet direct, like, but you feel the respect that you have for your dad. Mm -hmm. uh, the oldest of three boys, I, ha I have four boys. Mm -hmm. um, as you're saying that, I'm thinking about my oldest, who's almost 15. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I, what, it remind, remind me again, if I didn't hear correctly, but what were the critical ages that your dad was working a lot? 
I, I felt like it was from around the age of eight until, you know, until I left the house at 18. Um, yeah, those and, are he was, ages. and he was available like on the weekends and everything. It just, yeah, there was some personality issues, but I have to say what, what led me the respect that I ultimately found for my father. Uh, you know where that came from? Uh, I'm dying to know. It came from going on that journey myself. Okay. Yeah. Because for me, I always judged him. Yeah. It's like, I could judge you like, Oh, Oh, Larry could be a better podcast host. Oh, Larry could have done this. Oh, Larry could have done that. And then the minute you get a podcast show, you're like, Oh, Oh, <laughs> yeah. So it's actually not that easy to, no. you know, maintain a family and maintain a marriage and raise your children and all this other stuff. So I, I feel like what really closed the gap in terms of my deep respect for my father was when I made a decision, uh, probably in my late twenties to stop judging him and focus on myself. Mm -hmm. And then I found that, you know, the journey is not easy for any of us. Right. Yeah. And I love how you give that gratitude because I think we all go through phases, you know, me included to where we really struggle with blaming our parents for certain things. And I think mm -hmm. when we become parents ourselves, you've been a, you're, you've been a dad now for 10 and a half years. You have a daughter, mm -hmm. you have a son, you start to realize you're like, wow, I think he was probably doing the best job he could with the information that he had at the time. And I also think just to give your dad some acknowledgement and some appreciation as well is your dad does, and I want the audience to hear this. I'm going to say it twice. Your dad does what a lot of us men do, which is, work long hours, work very, very hard to provide, right? And that comes from a very noble place. It comes from a very selfless place. But at the same time, you, my friend, have just exemplified, you know, like, yeah, that was great, but I didn't get to see him that much during the week. And I, he was kind of like a, a weekend dad. We had a good relationship, but like had to do over again, I would have liked to have had a better connection with him, even though he was providing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also, you know, a friend of mine, Warren Farrell, uh, who's written a, a bunch of books, he said, when was the moment when your father lost the glint in his eye, Ooh. the gleam in his eye? Dude, that <laughs> and, and for me, I always knew, and my father has, uh, you know, I'm not going to tell his story, but he's uh, spoken to me that, you know, his job didn't excite him. Yeah. I mean, it was it was a means to an end. Mm -hmm. He was very good at it. My father's a very, very uh, smart man. Um, he's a mathematician and a physicist. And, wow. Uh, yeah, he's very, very smart. And uh, but it, it didn't it didn't it didn't set his soul on fire, you know? So I remember when we would go to uh, Greece as a, as a kid, his friends who he kept li lifelong friends there, they would come up to me and say, your father is, is crazy. Your, <laughs> <laughs> your father is, your father is this, your father is that. And I would look at my father, I'd say, that guy? Like, I don't, I don't know him to be that guy. I know him to be the guy that wakes up at five in the morning and shaves and showers and gets on a train and goes to New York and comes home and, you know, he's wiped out. And I don't know this guy that you speak about. And uh, in the book, it, you know, the primal method, I, I do, and this is relevant to, to your uh, father audience, I do recommend that fathers... Uh, if they cannot show, of course, we show our kids who we are through action, but tell them who you are too. Tell them what, tell them what made you who you are, you know, tell them what sets your soul on fire. Let your son see who you are, you know, and uh, that was just not something that was really done back then. So, yeah, you know, that's fascinating what you just said. Because I think there's a part of us that we don't want to share those things, you know, and <clears throat> I used to be that way myself growing, you know, I, I'm raising four young men right now. Right. Mm -hmm. And my childhood was insanity. And I don't share, I mean, the audience has known me for six years, so they, they've heard my story, but 
And for those of you guys who are new to the podcast, I mean, mom, my mom was married three times. My biological father and her were divorced when I was younger. I ran, I never knew him. I ran into him by accident when I was 12. We had a very brief relationship for six months that ended. And then I had a, I met him as a total fluke when I was 30 in a coffee shop here in St. Louis. And we've had a relationship ever since, but what I can tell you is there was a lot of chaos. There was a lot of uncertainty that there was not psychological safety in my house. There was mental, physical, verbal abuse, abuse by the men my mom was with, by my mom. There's a lot of alcohol. I, th- I think that there was drug use. I can't confirm that. At the same time, you know, so my kids every now and again will ask like, why, why are you doing data edge? Like, mm-hmm. and it, and I, I, this sounds self-serving to say, and I always mm-hmm. joke with my kids, but they're like, you're already a good dad. I was like, well, you, you don't remember me before I started doing this podcast. Like, Mm -hmm. that's why you think I'm a good dad because I was not at the time. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when I share Mm -hmm. like who dad is and where dad came from, I'll get like this sympathy, even my oldest, you know, I think the oldest, you're the oldest of three. So like the oldest is kind of like this young adult and they're also, they read people well, they're very empathetic. Right. And that's the way my, and he always tells me, he's like, I feel so bad for you. I was like, don't. Mm -hmm. Don't feel bad for me. You know why? Because I'm doing the stuff now because of where we came from and who I am now. So I think that's really powerful. And I think you're right. right. A lot of men, I think the last statistic that I read, 82% of men go to a job that they hate. Mm -hmm. Isn't that crazy? Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. By the way, thank you for, you know, for, I learned when I, when I uh, hear you describe your story and why you do the podcast. I feel like you're a man who, who really has found a way to convert his pain into gold and, and who's on a journey that there's no turning back from. Like, I'm sure you believe as I do that as good or even great as a father, I am, I'm nowhere near what I believe my potential to be. Sure. Yeah. I, I feel like I've just, just tapped, you know, just kind of struck gold a little bit, but yeah. there's so much there to become more, more present, to become more loving and to know when to be firm too, yeah. because a lot of times, however we were parented, we react to that style. So if you had a very absent father, you become a very involved father, but you don't know when to step back and let your kid fall and skin their knees. Yep. And don't, don't pick him up. You know, it, it's, there's, there's a lot, you know, there's a balance that needs to be found in my experience. I think also if you came from a home that was challenged, mm-hmm. you are more likely to be overly protective, overly nice, overly serving to the point where you're not necessarily raising self-sufficient young men and women. Mm-hmm. What you're doing is, is you're like, I wasn't taken care of as a kid. So I'm just, I'm, I'm pouring it all on full throttle, right. full steam. Right. ahead, Right. So it, and real quick, before we get into your family, now your wife and your yeah. kids, and then your book, is your dad still with us? Mm-hmm. He okay. is. He is. What, what's your relationship with him now? It's, it's very sweet and very tender. Nice. Um, we, we, uh, he lives and my, my mother and father live in New York city. Um, we, keep in touch right now, mainly through, you know, Zoom and, and through FaceTime and things like that. And, um, but yeah, it's, I, I feel like it, it's been a real gift, Larry, to get to know my father as an adult. Yeah. And it's a gift, as you said, we'll talk maybe a little bit about my own current family, my wife and kids. My wife immigrated here also, ironically, at the same age that my father did, you know, uh, from a foreign country. And uh, I really would love to give her the opportunity to know her parents as an adult. Because I feel it, it, I don't know if you can relate like the difference between seeing your father at age 12 and seeing him at 30. You know? Oh, totally. Totally different, right? Yeah. There's so I mean, much more understanding, I feel. No. There is I, even at 30, like when I was reunited with my dad, I had just become a father for the first time when I was 30. Mm-hmm. And now that I'm 45, mm-hmm. you know, and my dad is 73, I have even more compassion for the guy. Mm-hmm. Like almost like when we're shoulder to shoulder, I'm like, yeah, man, 
because he he raised i have two younger half brothers that mm-hmm. you know, I, I didn't know growing up but you know we we're both we're, we're both now have raised or or and are raising men right so it is cool to talk about what it's like to raise young men and even though some of the past that he and i've been through it hurts we've gotten past that and now we exchange you know best ideas about how to parent which is pretty cool so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, tell me, tell us about your family now. Tell us about your wife. I know you got into that a little bit, but you have a daughter who's 10. You have a son who's five. Yeah. Tell us about them. Yeah. Uh, I have, uh, I mean, my, my pride and joy are are my, my daughter and my son. Um, I, I would be, I would be doing myself a disservice and, and the listeners if I didn't say that, having especially when i first had my daughter it it opened my heart in a way that i I never even realized that it was closed i I didn't i didn't think that i could like love another human being like that so so selflessly and um my my kids are you know uh yeah they they push me they push me to uh, to provide and to provide a great life. And, um, I'm very happy for that because if I didn't have them, I probably, I'd be okay with, you know, uh, uh, not a mediocre life, but I, I certainly wouldn't be striving the way that I am in my, in my life to provide, you know, a, a rich life, you know, uh, not materially, but spiritually. Um, and my wife, uh, you know, we've, as I said, we've been married uh, almost 14 years and uh, it's been a crucible for intense uh, growth. And um, we, we care for each other and love each other deeply. And as most marriages do, we, we take out a lot of our, dyna- our old dynamics out on each other. Uh, but, you know, fortunately, we, we've worked through and are working through a lot of that. So we've been managed to do the most important thing, which is stay in the boat. Keep the boat going in the direction that you know it needs to go. In. So we're both still in the boat. 14 years later, we're both going in the direction that it needs to be going. And by going the direction it needs to be going, don't don't settle for a mediocre uh, tolerate a mediocre relationship, like really try to make it the relationship of, of your dreams. And, um, that's, that's our vision as men. And I love that. I want to, so I'm glad you went there. Cause I'm going to ask you about that. Mm-hmm. Here's another scary t- statistic. And I, man, um, everyone knows that in the U S the divorce rates, 50%. Mm-hmm. I think what a lot of people don't know, but the audience knows, because I've been saying this for the past few months, mm-hmm. a lot of people don't know is that the 50% of marriages that stay together, 66%, so two thirds of marriages that stay together are settling. It's mm-hmm. like a relationship purgatory. It's like That's roommates, right? right? They're, they're emotionally disconnected. Scale of one to 10, it's five or below, right? In, those, right. in that 66%. Right. There's two reasons people stay together, and this is probably going to be no news to you. Finances and the perception of we have to stay together for the kids. Mm-hmm. Only one third of marriages that stay together can actually identify their relationship as working. Mm-hmm. So that's like 15% of all people who get married right. are actually somewhat happy, right? Right. And, and I'm surprised, I'm surprised at, at how high those numbers are in terms of how many people say they're happy. Right. I, I actually would guess the divorce rate is higher and that the amount of marriages that are just suffering and settling are even higher. Yeah. So I think what you've just outlined is that there are three choices that we know about, but actually there's a mysterious fourth that I'm going to give. Yeah. So choice one is you, you bail, you, you just get a divorce. Uh, choice two is you stick it out and suffer. Choice three is you're one of the lucky ones that has a, you know, a good marriage Choice four is this. You take it as your own personal duty and mission to breathe the life of love 
and joy and happiness into your relationship, no matter what. That's choice four. Yeah. I don't have a choice three marriage. My, mine is not the one that I, we just got married and we're like happily ever after and it's easy and oh my God, oh, 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 oh. no, it's not like that. Yeah. You know, and, and that's a choice that I have to make every day. And, and I don't have to, actually. I can do what I want. I can settle. I can end it. Um, uh, so it, it's just a choice, you know, that, that is available. I should say that. It's mm -hmm. available. Yeah. And uh, man, does that build some strong spiritual muscles. It does. And I'm going to ask you a how-to question now, okay? Because mm -hmm. here's, here's another kind of scary thing. I dove into, I mean, if you think about marriage, right? Mm -hmm. Society, I'm, I'm going to give, I'm going to let men off the hook real quick. And then I'm also giving them some tough love. It's not our fault that we don't know how to do marriage. Mm -hmm. I mean, within marriage, you know, I'm actually good friends with Lance Salazar and Brandy Salazar, Hal Elrod. They wrote the book, Miracle Morning for Couples. And in there, they identify four pillars of a legendary marriage. Self-care is one. Partnership. Partnership is the not so sexy stuff. The chores, the roles, the schedules, the dishes, the finances, right? It's all the stuff like you do this and I do that. Mm -hmm. Then there is friendship. It's like a deep knowing of each other. Hey, at the end of the day, like, are me and you buddies? Do we like to hang out? Like, are we in this together. And then of course, there's the fourth, which is intimacy, which is mental, emotional, physical intimacy, right? And that's the easy stuff. Now on those four pillars, what, the, what holds those up, the foundation is communication. Mm -hmm. Under communication, you have all kinds of things, emotional validation, tactical empathy, mirrors, labels, active listening, allowing your woman space and time to vent and you not solve her problems, like just things like that, right? And that's just a few of them. So knowing that most people have no clue what that structure even looks like. Cause we have no idea. I think, think about this. We all, I think the majority of listeners have high school diplomas, right? Mm -hmm. Four years of education. I would say a lot of them have associates degrees or bachelors, right? That's, that's two to four years. Then you have people in the audience or wherever else with master's degrees. That's another two years. Then PhD, another two years, right? Think about anything that we're going to, if you want to be a doctor, you have to go through eight years of education. Mm -hmm. To be a cop is 990 hours of training, right? But to be married, it's like, Oh yeah, uh, we love each other. We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. It's almost we we gave this analogy on one of our previous shows because one of the guys in our mastermind, he's an OBGYN, and he was on one of our Q and As that we do. And I'm and I asked him. I was like, I was like, Doctor Rafiq. I was like, if you went, if you decided not to go to medical school, and you're like, you know what, I think I'm going to be an OBGYN. I'm going to deliver babies. I'll, I'll figure it out. I'm going to wing it. Like, would anybody come to you as a patient and be like, oh yeah, cool, you'll figure it out. It's been a gazillion babies born, like you'll figure it out. And we would never think to do that, right? But we do that in our marriages. But I think a lot, I think the miss and the gap is that we don't know how. We don't even know what the structure looks like. The structure I just laid out, most of us don't know that. So the question back to you is, what's your wife's name, by the way? Satomi. Satomi. So how do you and Satomi make choice for like what what are just a couple tactics? and behaviors that you both do maybe on a daily or at least a weekly basis that keep that relationship at an optimal level? You know, I'll tell you the one thing that has uh, worked and probably saved our marriage. And that is we, when we needed oxygen for the marriage, we got it. Like if we had to go on a week, uh, a weekend retreat, we've been on numerous couples retreats and it, it's something about being in a room with other couples in a facilitated manner by, you know, uh, somebody who really can guide that process. Uh, it's just you're in that room with that couple, the couples, and you're just looking at everybody and you're like, wow, we're all in the same boat. Mm -hmm. and, and something about that has diffused a lot of the, you know, um, the unique, like where we think it's only us, you know? You know, we say this all the time, but isolation is the enemy of excellence. We say that from an individual standpoint, but I, I think you just nailed it that from a, even a couple standpoint, mm -hmm. if you're a couple and you think you're the only people in the world going through what you're going through, that isolation alone is 
going to eat away at you. Coupled with the fact that you're, you might be looking outside of yourself and comparing and despairing. Like you might be seeing people post something on Instagram of how happy they are, like as though they never fight, as though they never go through these things. Right. You know, so I, by the way, I, I know we're going down the topic of marriage, which is great. I don't consider myself uh, an expert. However, what, what I will tell you is that my commitment to my, to working through the obstacles and the difficulties and, and staying the course in marriage, I believe it helps me reach down to young men and ask them to work through their own battles. And they know that I am not just a preacher. I'm a practitioner. Mm -hmm. I know that because I, I know that the same hurts, the same frustrations, the same fears, the same delusions that these young men are crippled by, I'm also struggling with, but I'm fighting the good fight. So therefore, I can speak to them with authority. I want you to fight the good fight because it's worth it. So there's this, you know, uh, bond. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a good pretty, mixture between not preaching from like you're, you know, a thing or two, right? But you're not yeah. preaching from the pulpit. You know, it's more like your shoulder to shoulder, like, hey, I'm a student with you. I'm just a little That's bit right. ahead of you. And I understand a few things, a few simple things to help make all the difference. That's what you just said is the exact words I use to every single young man that I've ever worked with. See, I see you. I see you. See you. <laughs> that's the exact. That's the exact thing that I say to them. I yeah. say, I'm not coming to you as an expert who solved everything in his life but I do believe I'm a few steps ahead of you and I may be able to offer something to you and you'll be able to offer something to me. We'll teach each other because we're, we're all on this, this ascent, this very difficult ascent. And um, we're never there. I, I tell the young men that I work with all the time, the only difference between me and you is that I'm higher up the mountain. But guess what happens when you're higher up the mountain? What happens to the oxygen? It's a little thinner. What happens to the, the, the incline? A little, a little steeper. steeper. And what happens if you fall? It's a little it's further. A little, little further, a little more consequences. Yeah. Suddenly you're not losing your job at, you know, uh, like a job that you could replace, but you're losing a career. You're losing a marriage. You're losing kids. You're losing everything. So the only thing that's different me, between me and them is the degree of difficulty and the stakes. But fortunately, I, I have the tools to, to go on this journey that I'm on. And they can too. They have to acquire the tools to go on the journey. I love that. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because there's one thing that that approach I think really does well. So not only for clients, and not only for kids, but for marriage as well, what that provides is psychological safety mm -hmm. because people, it, it's hard. It's almost, <laughs> it's a, it, for, for all you guys who are Catholics out there and you know what confession is, right? Even though that that priest has probably heard every single sin known to man, right? Mm -hmm. You still feel terrified beyond belief to go confess any sins or any of your dirty laundry, because you know that that guy is preaching from the pulpit, right? Mm -hmm. you do, there's no longer that feeling of like, yeah, man, I'm here with you. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think what that does is it makes us very guarded. You know, it's the same thing. Like when, when I grew up, the message was, um, I'm right because I'm mom and I'm right because I'm dad and I'm not sorry ever. Right. That's what, that's what we hear. That's what I heard all the time. And mm -hmm. th th it created so much dissonance between us, so much space. And one of the things that I've learned by doing this podcast, and it sounds like you've learned it as well, is to remain very, very human. Mm -hmm. Because when you're human, that makes you relatable. And when you're relatable, you create psychological safety within people that they feel that they can tell you what's truly on their mind and heart. And that, especially if you're a dad, mm -hmm. like I want to raise my kids at the very core. And I, I get the feeling you do too. 
at the very core of what I'm doing with these kids is obviously teaching them to be good humans. But when something goes wrong in their life, I don't want them to be like, oh crap, I can't tell my dad. When something goes wrong, I want them to be like, oh crap, I'm going to call my dad. Because you've created this bond and this connection like, hey man, I'm not going to judge you. Let me help. Let me, let me guide you here, right? Yeah. And I'm not going to solve it for you. I'm not going to do it for you. Exactly. Because I, I can't. Right. It's, I'll, help, I'll help guide you. I'll walk you through it, but I'm not going to be throwing you a golden parachute. That's but right. I'll be there with you. That's what they, they talk about a lot of this. You've heard of snow plowing parents. <laughs> I, I, no. You never heard of that? I have, I've uh, heard the helicopter. I have not heard the snow plow. Yeah, the snow plow. Like they, they get in front of their kids and they snow plow the whole way for them. You know, they, they basically clean okay. the road. Yeah. And it, this is a mistake. It's a huge you know, mistake. At least in my opinion. I'm getting a little echo. I don't know if that's me. I don't hear any echoes. The only thing I hear are some drips in the background. I didn't know if that was your faucet. That's, that's my Buddha statue. Let me turn that off. <laughs> Let me turn the Buddha off. Yeah, turn the Buddha off. And by the way, we're, uh, we're not going to edit this. Hey, while Gregory steps away, though, uh, I'm going to tell you guys about we've been talking a lot about marriage in this particular show. Uh, as you guys have heard in other podcasts, if you go to our homepage, gooddadproject.com, you will see a brand new free resource in there for you called 21 Days to an Extraordinary Marriage, where basically what it is is 15 emails over 21 days. What it's going to do is it's going to map out strategies, structure, conversations, and three challenges in a way that you can connect with your wife in a way that maybe you haven't in the past, or maybe you just haven't in a long time. So if your marriage has gotten eh, a little stale, maybe it's like tiny little warm coals around the campfire. This is a good way to take some gasoline and, and dump it on there. So mm. again, go to gooddadproject.com right there below, right on top of the landing page there. You'll see a 21 days to an extraordinary marriage. Okay. Now the boot is done going to the bathroom. Gregory is back. The boot is, uh, <laughs> has taken a break. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. So I'm, dude, I'm super stoked to get into your book, the primal method mm. before we get into some of the nuts and bolts here. Um, where did all this come from? I mean, obviously it came from your journey because there was something missing from the time you were eight to the time you were 18. Mm -hmm. um, but where, when was it where you were scratching your head and you're like, Hmm, yeah, I think I'm going to write about this. Mm. Yeah. So I, I had been, uh, you know, I work in the field of addiction counseling. Okay. And I had worked uh, probably for about, six years, six, seven years in different rehabilitation settings. And if there's, there's one commonality with all, all the different rehabilitation settings, it's that they provide a lot of structure. Okay. And I saw that within that structure, I saw people were capable of making miraculous transformations. You know, uh, a mother who was putting alcohol as the most important thing in their life was now like finding spirituality and being of service and becoming a humble, devoted mother. Uh, and you could say the same for a young man, you know, a very immature, bratty kid who's just using drugs, you know, becomes somebody who has a sense of purpose and passion. You see these types of transformations, you know, in rehabs. Uh, but when I opened up my own private office, uh, people, you know, people, the people that came were mostly young men initially. And in the first year or two, uh, I became very disillusioned with what I was seeing, which is that all the people that were making these great transformations in rehab, uh, they, they were not staying the course. It, it, it was just a brief glimpse. And uh, this one thing that I found is that traditional talk uh, therapy and all the, the approaches that I had been trained in, they were not really helping these young men. So I was growing very frustrated. And in the mix of that desire for, you know, a, a true transformation and uh, the frustration that it wasn't happening. And just a boredom at sitting in an office with a 21-year-old 
boy asking him, you know, about his feelings and, you know, trying to help him solve problems in his life. It was just not, it was not exciting to me or to them in a mixture of that whole uh, scenario. I made a decision and the decision was we are not going to meet in the office anymore. Or I didn't say anymore, but I said, let's, let's go outside. I don't care what we do, but let's just go do something. And that decision to leave the office was like a domino that just started going like this. And it knocked a whole pattern into place. And when we left the office, I started doing things uh, intuitively that started to really reach these young men. And I did that for, you know, probably three or four years. And, and lo and behold, uh, these young men started to experience transformation. And not just the brief transformation, transformation that was lasting. And, and they, were, they were growing into independent men who could create their own life, right? A life that they considered to be their own and that they were happy with. Well, this was something big. This was big news because actually working with young men, it's a very difficult population to reach. Most professionals will admit to that. So here I was, uh, I had worked with, uh, uh, you know, a number of guys to the point where I knew, okay, this wasn't just uh, one guy or two guys. I, I can really look at parents and a young man and say, I have a way of working a reliable way of working with you, with your son in a way that, that will produce the mighty change. Uh, well, you know, I made a decision to, to write about it and to try to figure out what it was that I was doing. And that journey uh, lasted about four years and culminated in the book, Primal Method. And I outline uh, different tools that I've identified that are common in all of the work that I've done with young men. And who would you say, I know you started with rehab and uh, the structure and that kind of thing, but who is this book really for? Well, I wrote the book to appeal to be able to be read by a young man. Okay. I wanted a 20, I wanted it to be a book that if you or I was 20 years old or 20 for 28, we could read it and be like, wow, I, I get it. You know, this guy is offering something of value. Okay. But uh, the book can definitely be read and should be read by fathers and people that are in the lives of these young men. And the funny thing, Larry, is the, the most uh, excited uh, feedback or critiques that I'm getting are of men in our category who are, are like, wow, this is, a, this is a great book. And it gives me uh, a resource to read with my son and to talk about some of the themes that come up. So I, I really believe that, that the book, um, it can be read by a professional, a parent, or a young man. Um, my, my hope ultimately is that it reaches young men, but I know that they have a difficult time reading. <laughs> of course. Yeah. It's hard to keep their attention. Yeah. You know, when I first read your description, it was a lot the, the movie that I thought of right away, even though I've actually, I've never seen the movie. I just know the premise, which is that failure to launch movie mm -hmm. where, you know, it's uh, men have a hard time growing up. You know, we don't really right. take young men through rites of passage anymore. Exactly. Every, we live in a society of immediate gratification right? All you got to do is open your phone, ask for whatever you want. And it's there. Right. You want food delivered to your house, DoorDash, right? You want right. to look something up on the internet, just Google it. Right. And, um, but what is, what are you seeing here as far as, you know, again, I want to talk to the men who are raising young men mm -hmm. and maybe we're talking to a guy who struggles with some of the things that you identify in that book. Mm -hmm. So what, what does, the, what is the book What's the premise of the book and what's the, what's the struggle? Yeah. Well, the first thing uh, I'll tell you, the premise of the book, uh, there's a number of them. The, the premise of the book is that you, by talking to 
or at or even with uh, a young man, you are missing the boat. Because what is really going to reach this young, what we call emerging male, what's going to what's going to reach him is not talk. It's, it's action and connection. Mm. So, and most of the dads listening to this know this, they've had the lectures uh, where they've lectured their sons. And uh, first of all, even if your son is listening to you as you're telling him the ways of the world, it's, it's not reaching him at the deeper level because he's not implementing it. He's not, he's not doing, uh, gaining that knowledge through experience. It's just information that makes sense to him. So the, one of the big premises is instead of talking at your kid, okay, or at this young man, get into action with him, do something with him. And in doing that, cultivate a sacred bond, which is uh, achieved by two men sharing an experience. That's, a, that's powerful. And what I saw and what I believe that the men, uh, both the, the young men and the, the fathers listening to this, what they will find is that there's some magic in, in this, this uh, shared action uh, where you form this connection. And the connection is actually the, that's what they need anyway. They don't need the lectures on the ways of the world, right? So that, I think that's, and I would just add one more thing uh, that, um, and this is where the, the title of the book, The Primal Method, is we're trying to tap not into the rational mind, but into the primal mind, okay? It's, it's, that, it's that, you know, you, you mentioned, you, want, you, you said if your kids were to go through a problem, you want them to reach out to you. I thought you were going to go in a different direction, but I, I agree with you and I like what you said. I thought you were going to say that you want them to know that when they hit a problem, that they believe in themselves, that they, they know that even if it looks like they're going to fail, they fully believe in themselves, in their ability to succeed, and they know how to seek out the resources, which may or may not include us right? As fathers, but they believe in themselves. That is what I call primal motivation. Okay. They fully believe and they fully want to win and to succeed. This is priceless. It is. Hey, can you give us some examples of, I'm guessing types of connections that we can make Maybe even things that you've done. I mean, you mentioned going outside uh, and and doing things. It sounds like there's some physical physical traits yeah. to this to this whole process, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've done I've done everything uh, that you can imagine with my with the guys I work with. I've uh, made pizza with them. I've done yoga with them. I've shopped for prom dresses with them. I've traveled with them. I've hiked mountains with them. I've done everything. But one comes to, just came to mind as you, you asked me that question. Okay. Uh, I, I was working with a young guy. He was probably 21, 22. And I had worked with him for probably about a year. So we had a real solid bond. And uh, I knew that uh, he was, I knew that if he wanted to be sober, and if he chose to, if he chose to, that he could do it. And I wanted him to experience what sobriety, by the way, sobriety means not having, not taking any drugs and alcohol, right? Uh, I wanted him to commit to that for a certain amount of time so that he could experience what, what that really is like. And I said to him, I said, and his parents were, were on me and on him, like, listen, he's been working with you and things are getting better, but he's still, you know, he's smoking weed on the weekends. He's drinking. He got drunk last week. So I said to him, I said, listen, I said, how about this? You, you give me, you give me uh, this summer. It was like May or June. I said, you give me this whole summer sober. 
so sober summer. And uh, if you can't, then you agree to one of two things. And I get to choose the, which one it is. You either go balls to the wall in AA, which is Alcoholics Anonymous, dotting every I, crossing every T. You, you do everything that I tell you to do, right? And, and in terms of your recovery, or you go to rehab. And he said, he said, okay, fine. And then he said, what, what about you? He said, what, what about me? He said, well, if I lose, there's consequences. But what about you? If I stay sober, what happens to you? And I said, well, you know, the gift is for you, not for me, right? And he, he gave me a look like, come on, bro. Like, you got to have some skin in the game. So I said, fine. I said, you choose two things. And if you're able to uh, stay sober uh, this summer, then I'll, I'll choose or whatever, however we said it, uh, one of the two things. And he, he loved sushi. So I was thinking like, oh man, maybe he'll choose this thing, like go to a, like a $600 a plate sushi dinner in New York City or something, something crazy, you know? Well, that would actually would be something I would want to do. Well, he said, I only have one thing skydiving and i said oh god because i i really hate surrendering my life into like surrendering control and he knew that well he stayed sober for that whole summer and i i remember people say what was it like to skydive the only thing i remember is when i jumped out of the plane and when we landed on the ground i said i'm asking these guys to, that's essentially what I'm asking them to do. I'm asking them to jump out of a plane, quote unquote, and trust that there's a new life awaiting for them. You see? So I need to be willing to do the same thing with them. I need to be willing to jump out of my own plane. I need to be willing to. So I don't know if that answered your question. It's kind of a long story, but uh, the bottom line is, you know, do, do things with these young men and and make it have stakes on both ends. Let them see you, let them see you striving as a man, you know, uh, not, not perfect, you know, pick, pick something that, that maybe they're better than you, or, you know, let them sh show them what it's like for a man to enter an arena where he's uncomfortable and to do his best. And something in that creates a very, very special bond between the men. Man. So yeah, skydiving, man, I'm right there with you. I have yeah. not done that yet. It is on my bucket list, but <laughs> the way you phrased that was surrendering your life to the unknown, to the uncontrollable. Yeah, I get that. I want to ask you a question. I'm going to give you a minute here to think about it because I want to share just a quick story that's, sure. I think, in line with this. I, I didn't even think this would be in line with it because I, I didn't really know exactly what direction we were going to go in. I would love to know an example of, so it sounds like you've done a variety of different things that are physical and outdoors, which I think is really cool, especially with, with young men. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to know what are some of the themes or the conversations or the teachings that you're able to have during these moments where you're outdoors with these young men. So like, mm -hmm. what is, what is, so if you're taking someone out on a hike or you're going up a mountain or you're doing whatever, what certain themes are you trying to teach? And I want you to even think about your own son. I know who's five now. And while you think about that, I just want to share a quick story because back in 2019, I took both my two oldest boys on a ride of passage and I took each one of them up a 14er in Colorado. Uh, my 12 year old and I hiked up Mount Quandry. My 14 year old and I hiked up Mount Bierstadt. Uh, it took us 10 to 12 hours each way for round trip. And then the mountain was a representation of the ending of boyhood, the journey to the top. And then the descend was your, was your descension into your, your, your new life into manhood. When we got to the top, I read them this letter and it had, it, it had uh, seven pillars of becoming a man and what that is. So like, for instance, uh, I wasn't prepared to talk about this. So I don't know it off the top of my head. It was, mm -hmm. it was two years ago, but it, uh, respect and honesty was one. Work ethic was another. Money management was another. Faith, how to treat women. Um, mm -hmm. All these things, right, of becoming a man. And it was one of the most amazing 
experiences. I was always close with my boys, Mm -hmm. but that has been something that has solidified our relationship in such a way. And it was so representative for them. I'm like, okay, Mm -hmm. you are now a young man. Mm -hmm. The other, the other caveat that I put into this hike going up the 14 or it's no easy task going up a 14,000 foot mountain Mm -hmm. was I told them we could probably get done with this hike in eight hours, but we're going to take it. We're going to take 10 to 12 because what we're going to do is we are going to stop probably every hour for a good 10 minutes. And we're just going to enjoy the view of where we're at. Mm -hmm. We're going to acknowledge and appreciate where we came from. Cause the one thing that's going to amaze you is where we're at and how far down uh, up the mountain you've already come. Mm-hmm. And then we're going to talk about what that summit looks like. Mm-hmm. Most people, as they go through life, and this was a big learning for them, they're so focused on getting to the top of that mountain. They never stop and take, take in the appreciation and the presence and the intention mm-hmm. where they're at right now and how far mm-hmm. they've come. Mm-hmm. So those were two events that, man, they were so important to those kids' lives and to our relationship. And then the final thing we did was, is I I have a photo of them and we blew it up by a 20 by 36 photo. Each, each kid is standing on my shoulders and we're at the top of 14,000 foot mountain. So that was truly special. Not that you have to do a 14 er but again, going back to my question to you is what are, what are some conversations? What are some themes? Mine was more of a rite of passage, but what are some themes and conversations and connections that you've done that you think would help the men who are listening? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Uh, you know, first, I, I just want to say, um, uh, that's a great thing that you did. Oh, thanks. Very, very special. And I love that you, you took time, you know, through the journey to, uh, to appreciate it and to honor you know, how far you've come so far, you know, um, very special, very special. I like that. Um, so in, I want to just contextualize my answer. The men, the young men that I'm working with have usually really lost their way in life. And oftentimes, no matter how smart they are, I, got, I get the feeling that they've lost touch with the basic fundamentals. It's almost like the old adage of return to the, the fundamentals of blocking and tackling, right? You, it, if you make things too complicated, sometimes you can lose your way. So I try to really boil down my work with these young men to the very simple building blocks of life. And that includes uh, relationships. And I use my relationship with them as as a um, uh, microcosm. Like we, we really try to cultivate a true relationship. So a lot of what we talk about is our, our relationship, you know, and how to work through conflict that comes up. And the other is getting a job, okay? Um, Again, the guys that I work with are very smart. Some of them, they go on, they're doctors, they're going to be lawyers, they're going to be, you know, but, but they struggle with the fundamentals. So I try to keep things very simple and I don't have any, any agenda in terms of, you know, um, all I want them to do is to learn how to simply enjoy Uh, life and being in a relationship. So all of our conversations, even though other things may come up, they get in a fight with their parents. Um, You know, usually, usually what I'm targeting is their faulty belief system. You know, you as a young man, and maybe you can remember this, you're, you're 20 years old, you're 24 years old, you've got this whole set of beliefs. You think you know everything. Okay. At some point, you realize that your way of life, no matter how strongly you believe, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And 
there, there is that moment with, with the guys that I work with that we have to look at what is their belief system and why, where did you get the idea that that's how this huge magical thing called life and works? I don't, I haven't found that life works that way. So a lot of our conversations are just kind of basic like how, why do you believe that that's how life works? Cause I believe that I have found through experience that it's, it works differently and it's far better to believe this. So a lot of the conversations is just, is just like that, you know? Fascinating. So just new perspective, being able to see life through a different lens. Mm -hmm. You're right. I mean, a a man in his twenties, I mean, those, I mean, you talk about the ages of eight to 18 where they were, those were critical years for you. Mm -hmm. I also think it's critical years for a man in his twenties and even in his thirties, right. To have a mentor. I mean, you said you have someone who's just a little bit further up the mountain than, than you are because you're right at, at that age, they're, there's something very dangerous about living like living that way. I remember when I was in my twenties and I thought like, Oh wow, this is, this is what life is. You know, it's like work Monday through Friday, party on the weekends, like just is what it is. Right. Maybe I'll get married. Not sure what that's going to look like, but I think having a mentor or a guide, which I didn't have at that point in my life would have made all the difference in the world. And I think that's really what you're getting at. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Even just something like that, like you mentioned with the marriage, like, a man reaches a point in his marriage where he says, this woman who I married is not my best friend. Well, where did, where did you get the idea that this person that you're with is just going to magically be your best friend through no, through no effort on your part? Well, I, I just feel like we should just be amazingly compatible in every possible way. Well, where did you get that idea? Like, Please show me the book that you're studying from that told you that that's how marriage works, because I actually find that it's totally different, (laughs) you know? So it's, again, and this is where having a circle of men, including an intimate mentor who knows you and cares about you and empathizes you, but also knows how to tell you the truth. You know, I, what I say to, to, to society is stop pumping young men full of lies Stop it. Stop telling these young men that this is how life works and this is who they are and this and that. And that. stop lying to them. Tell them the truth about life. You know, tell them the truth about themselves to the best of your ability. And for me, that's that's what I want. I don't I don't want to. Uh, I don't I don't care about how I want life to believe to be. I don't care about how I want life to be. I want to, I want to know how life is. I hear you, man. Um, this has been amazing and, and unexpected too. So if, if you men are going to take any theme from this podcast, is it to connect with your kids? Maybe not talk to them, yeah. but tell them about life, but get them out of the grind, do something with them. I mean, think of, think of all these different things. You could hike, camp, you could climb a 14 or if you really want to do something like that. But I agree with you. The fact that it's ex- shared experiences yes. that elevate a relationship. There you go. You, and if you can leverage an experience with a lesson, it truly solidifies, I think, that lesson. And That's right. Right? And, and life will always provide the lesson. I love it, man. Well, as we wrap up here, uh, this is Gregory, this has been great. Uh, as, but as we wrap up here, is there anything we've missed? No, no. I think, you know, my, my invitation it, to young men is to get the book and to start reading the book and uh, to fathers too. And I, I hope that we can create some venues and experiences where we can talk about the themes because this is just the first step. This is just the first step of many, you know, Lao Tzu said uh, the journey of a thousand miles 
begins with a single step. This is a single step. And it, it gives an opener to a conversation that we can have. But I think, I think we did a great job um, giving of ourselves today. And uh, I'm very happy with uh, what we talked about. I agree. And just to recap some themes here, mm -hmm. uh, critical ages, I think you nailed it. Eight to 18. It's a critical mm -hmm. age to be a part of a young man's life. Number two, I love the four, four outcomes of a marriage that you talked about. Right. And I, and I hope you men got it of what that number four really looks like. And of course, to recap those statistics, I don't have to repeat them, but only 15% of marriages are actually working, right? So, and if you believe Gregory, it's only five, right? Exactly. <laughs> Some people lied in you know, that survey. But the other thing, too, is, is how can you add in the tactics, the behaviors, and the training to build that extraordinary marriage? Mm -hmm. And then on top of it, if you're raising young men, are you raising young men? How important is it to maybe get outside, out of the uh, out of under your own roof and share an experience and a conversation and a connection about life versus just sitting eye to eye over, over the breakfast table. So right. I love that, man. Right. And, and finally, don't, don't pick something that puts you on the elevated status. Pick yeah. something where the two of you are equal. Take, take a class in jujitsu that you've never taken. Yeah. You know, um, if, if, Take a swimming lesson if you both don't know how to swim. Take a dance lesson. Take an improv comedy lesson. Let, let your son see oh. how you go through life when you're not the expert. Because even if they resent you for it, they, they feel like you're putting yourself on as the expert. And we're not experts. We're all men on the journey of life. And life is way bigger than all of us. So humble yourself and show your son how you go through the process of becoming a man. I know we're almost done, but I, I want to recap that because that was a very solid point right there mm -hmm. is that we can always be a lifelong student. We don't always have to be the expert. Mm -hmm. um, I love the suggestion of just doing things you would never do, like swimming, jujitsu, the, uh, the improv comedy thing. I mean, I might when this whole COVID thing is over, <laughs> I think that would be hysterical to do number uh -huh. one, but, um, you know, my kids, my, my boys, I, I didn't, I didn't grow up with a father and that's really no excuse. I'm not a very handy person, right? I have other skills and gifts. Being handy is just not one of them, mm -hmm. but I'm always open to, that's why I love YouTube. Like if I need to fix my furnace, I'm like, well, I'll, I'll see if I can figure it out first. And I always tell my kids, I'm like, we'll watch some YouTube and figure it out. But like, it was, um, about a year and a half ago, my kids were like, Hey, um, are you guys still wanting to put a backsplash up around the kitchen? I'm like, yeah. And they're like, how do you do that? I was like, I don't know. I was like, you want to go to Lowe's and take a class with me? And we did. It was me and my two oldest boys. And we, we learned how to yeah. you know, back, backsplash. I, I was like, dude, this is so awesome. And I, and I actually loved not being the expert. I'm like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Let's learn together. Right. Right. You don't always have to be the expert. In fact, I think our kids, it, respect us more when they're in the trenches learning with us instead That's of right. like, let me teach you. Right. That's right. Yeah. Beautiful. man. Where can men find your book and everything that you're doing? So the book is on uh, all the major sites and uh, it's the primal method by Gregory Kufakos. So just the primal method. Um, we, we do have a, a website, the primal method.org. And uh, I also have a mentoring program, uh, called Velocity Mentoring. So there's a number of ways, but I, I feel the best is is to start with the book. And uh, that's available very seamlessly from uh, Brother Amazon. And uh, I, hope they, I hope they enjoy it. Well, guys, you won't have to worry about all those links or anything like that. We're going to have everything for you in the show notes. All you have to do is to go to gooddadproject.com forward slash 304 for this show. We'll have all of Gregory's links in there, his books, his mentoring program. We'll have 21 Days to an Extraordinary Marriage, also our Dad Edge group on Facebook. Also, make sure 
you subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can actually watch this interview between me and Gregory. We'll have a link for you in the show notes for you as well. Go to gooddadproject.com forward slash 304. Gregory, thank you for coming on, my friend. This was great. Thank you for having me. You bet. Gentlemen, go out and live legendary. Take care. Mm -hmm.